Ava knows that time is now taking closer and closer to the big something that's going to happen, which, good, we're quickly approaching the halfway point of this book and literally nothing of actual value has happened. Yes, we're learning lots of stuff about Celine and a bit more about the world, but like, where is this going? I feel like there were better ways to have established all of this without every single character sitting on their hands and doing nothing. Hello and welcome to Percontation Points Video Snark. If you came here because you thought that this was an audiobook, please stick around and maybe learn some reading and listening comprehension skills. I read books, discuss what aren't wrong, and how they can possibly be fixed. I'm continuing my read-through of the Color Theory series by Ashley Busamonte. Not the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. Chapter 13. Ava decides to practice dream magic on somebody else who hates her but is less likely to try and hurt her. Sammy. Except, Sammy is probably the worst person to do this with since she knows what dream magic is and would likely report having seen Ava in her dream to Elm. The logic here is a little baffling. When Ava gets into Sammy's dream, she's kind of upset to see an image of Sammy and Elm necking on each other. This is the pure definition of play stupid games, win stupid prizes. She forces herself to wake up and then wonders if it was actually a dream or not, because Sammy and Elm have been gone for a week now, and although Ava trusts what Elm says, she's still worried that them being gone together would spark some kind of old feelings he might have had for Sammy. She decides that she wants to spend some time with Nikki and not think about dreams or magic, but when she goes to find her friend, she instead finds Nikki and Blake spending some quality time together, and although she's happy for both of her friends, she's still anxious over the dream. She goes to Elm's room where she rolls around on his bed for a moment. She at least has the maturity to acknowledge the fact that Blake and Nikki being in a relationship doesn't mean that they won't have any time for her, and to my immense surprise, she identifies that a lot of this isolation she's feeling is thanks to the emotional abuse she suffered at the hands of Celine. Chapter 14. The chapter opens up on Ava witnessing what might be a memory of Celine's. It's from when she was in school and mentalists were still part of the student body. A handsome young mentalist walks over to the student Celine and thanks her for her help with the paper. It's obvious that Celine likes this boy, Andres. But there's also an undercurrent of mentalists have so much power yet they mainly use it for pranks. When Ava wakes up, she wonders if what she witnessed was real or simply a figment of her imagination. She's still in Elm's room and the thought makes her angry that nobody went looking for her when somebody amongst them has been hurting people. She goes out in search of Blake and Nikki and decides to take her frustration out on him. After all, his canoodling with Nikki earlier, aka them messing around with their magic, is the entire reason why she was in Elm's room to begin with. No matter the fact that Ava is the one who made herself upset by deciding to be dumb and then made herself be further upset for no real reason after she saw Nikki and Blake together. I guess we'll take the character growth from the end of the previous chapter and chuck it out the window right now. She first goes for how he and Nikki had been messing around earlier, and part of me gets it because, again, they're not hiding in a cave for fun, but at the same time, it's not like they're doing anything of actual value while they're hiding in there. Ava is doing little baby magic experiments with the two of them. Nobody is plotting to actually do anything about the tyrannical government or anything important like that. But Ava chatting him over his relationship with Nikki quickly devolves into her being upset that he always treated her like an annoyance that he had to put up with every time they got a day off from school. Blake asks what's wrong with her and then naturally jumps to the fact that she's the one who's been actually canoodling with the mentalist, which is a fair assumption to make considering that she's acting completely unhinged. He tries to take her arm so that he can guide her to a place where they can have a mature adult conversation about why she's feeling like this. Instead, she shakes him off and has a random thought of, why shouldn't the augmenters be on top? Why does it always have to be the mentalist? Blake uses his own powers to make it rain small rocks under her and that kind of snaps her out of it. He acknowledges that she looked more than a little lost, but Ava doesn't know what to do with this information. She quickly leaves. We're shown another memory of Celine's, of her trying to ask Andres to the school dance and Celine getting angry when he tells her that he's already going with Delia. After Andres leaves, Celine is then bullied almost to the point of torture by two other mentalist students. As Ava watches this scene, a random spike of hate for mentalists runs through her. For no real reason, she thinks that the world doesn't know about her own mentalist abilities. She could totally re-enter society and pretend like she's nothing but an augmenter forever. Later, Celine approaches Andres and tells him about how some of the other mentalists have been bullying her. She asks for help in defending herself against them. Instead of being in any way remotely sympathetic towards anything Celine had gone through, Andres instead plays the magical racism card. He tells her that magical racism is preventing mentalists from becoming benefactors and that it's been six years since one was hired as a benefactor. His rejection only makes Celine vow to take care of the problem on her own. And I get that there are bullies everywhere, magical school or regular one, but the solution to bullies isn't to literally murder everybody who so much as reminds you of your bully. 
Ava wakes up with confusion since she didn't remember falling asleep that time either. She's still in Alm's room, but right now being surrounded by reminders of yellow magic is making her feel anxious. Outside his room, she runs into Bree, who suggests that they should go get some fresh air. As they go, and Ava has another moment of intense maturity that I usually don't see in young adult novels. Bree is really just a child. None of us should have to worry about running and hiding. None of us should have to worry that the adults around us could decide at any moment to forfeit our lives. Again, thank you so much for this. So many young adult novels have literal child soldiers and nobody ever talks about how messed up that it is. Outside of the cave, Ava lets her thoughts tumble through a lot of what-ifs. She, she mainly wants to know why letting Jace make everybody forget about yellow magic would be so bad. She wants to go back to simpler times. Mercifully, before this can go any further, Elm and Sammy show up. Ava is happy to see him, but she's also a little hesitant around him. He senses that something is wrong and asks what happened while they were gone. A moment later, he sends Sammy and Bree inside so that he can talk to Ava alone. Ava tells him about the attack on Blake and about how she and Blake have been trying to produce green magic. As she's talking, Elm runs his hands over the scratches on her arms from where Blake flung rocks at her. She kind of hedges around what actually happened without telling him that she feels weird. But then she can't help but pick a fight with Elm and tries to accuse him of mind controlling the group into obedience. Elm is obviously a little hurt that she'd continue to have thoughts like that. As he turns to go, Ava begins to cry and begs for help. When Elm asks what she's done, she finally admits that she went into Celine's dream. Elm gets upset and demands that she read something from the textbook. It basically says that inexperienced mentalists can often leave themselves vulnerable to the thoughts and emotions of the person that they were trying to dream with. Elm is obviously angry that she would have gone behind his back and the fact that she actively lied to him about not doing it. But he's relieved that this is all that it is and nothing about Ava having these new anti-yellow feelings. And a little impressed that she managed to do it on her first try without help. But that's enough talk about that. It's now time to talk about Sammy. Ava alodes on him about how anxious she's been that he's been alone with Sammy for a week. In turn, Elm tells her that Sammy comes from an abusive family background that made her be clinging with people that she's deemed as safe. He tells Ava that when he and Sammy were children, Sammy wanted to marry him so that they could always be together. He kind of laughs it off now and tells Ava that he's not going to hold anybody to a pinky promise made when they were five. But he also says that he won't hold Ava to any promises either. Ava gets upset, thinking that this is him breaking up with her. However, he explains that he knows that Celine's abuse did a number on Ava, that he's literally the first man that she's ever dated. It makes sense that she might want to romantically see other people. Ava tells him that it's nonsense, and then feels relieved when he says that he wants to fight to keep her by his side. Elm also makes her promise that she won't go into any more dreams. He doesn't know if her staying away from Celine will make Celine's thoughts go away, but she agrees that they have to take it one day at a time. She asks Elm to come with her so that she can apologize to Blake. However, as soon as the two men are together, they immediately have their hackles up. Blake is angry that Ava is likely going to dismiss him for Elm. Elm is upset that Blake intentionally hurt Ava. The two of them start fighting and Ava has to break it up. Ava then tells Blake what happened and why. Even better, it doesn't excuse my bad behavior towards you. I finish, but there's been a lot going on and my head is in on street. I wanted you to know. Yes, thank you. Please acknowledge that your own hurt doesn't excuse you having hurt other people in turn. She goes on to say that she appreciates Blake for everything that he's done for her, but also acknowledges that she knows that it's difficult for him with her mentalist boyfriend. Blake kind of thanks Ava and says that he'll think about it and then leaves. As soon as he's gone, Ava chides Elm for having picked a fight with Blake. He admits that he shouldn't have done that, and ugh, there's so much healthy communication here, admitting when they messed up and promising to learn from their mistakes moving forward. I don't even know what to do with myself. Chapter 15. We open on another memory of Celine's. It was kind of hinted at that Celine's own mother was a mentalist, but now we get confirmation of this. Mama is angry that Celine's brother ripped his uniform pants on accident and demands that Celine use her augmenter powers to punish him. When Celine refuses, Mama uses her mentalist powers on her daughter to force her to harm him. Except that when Celine is released from the mind control, she attacks her mother instead. Benefactors come rushing in, but they're on Celine's side. They say that all mentalists are evil and dangerous. After establishing who she is, they ask Celine if she'd like a job as a benefactor. And I say this in a lot of other novels, but I'm sorry that the terrible thing happened to you, but coming from an abusive background gives exactly nobody the right to turn around and abuse others. 
Ava wakes up to Elm standing over her. It's not really established, but I think he knew that she was experiencing another memory of Celine's. She asks what would happen if these memories never go away, to which he replies that he will remain by her side no matter what. Elm then proposes that the two of them go outside to tend to the sunflowers. She does want to go, but does not want to leave the cave unattended, so he proposes that she take Nikki or Blake instead. The two of them quickly agree to Ava's request, but she feels kind of weird with how quickly that they do agree, like they're treating her with kid gloves recently. As I take the boat out, Blake and Nikki question how it is that flowers grown in April are still alive as fall approaches. They eventually chalk it up to them not knowing anything about yellow sunflowers. When they get to the side, they see that it's swarming with bugger flies. Ava searches nearby for the device Elm uses to hide the yellow, but it's missing. She then takes her invisibility locket off and tells Celine that she can't possibly win. The three of them destroy as many bugger flies as possible before they leave. Ava is obviously super depressed that she won't be able to see the flowers anymore after this. Chapter 16 Ava knows that time is now ticking closer and closer to the big something that's going to happen, which, good, we're quickly approaching the halfway point of this book and literally nothing of actual value has happened. Yes, we're learning lots of stuff about Celine and a bit more about the world, but like, where is this going? I feel like there were better ways to have established all of this without every single character sitting on their hands and doing nothing. Ava tells the readers that she and Elm had tried to brace the others for what was to come, but she feels as if none of them fully grasped how dire that the situation is, that the cave is supposed to be temporary, a hiding place while they overthrow the government. Which I'd also like to remind everybody that when I say this, they have literally not been actually plotting to do the overthrowing. She's on kitchen duty with Sarah, but as she looks over to her friend, she's like, geez, you look terrible. Sarah kind of hand waves it away, but it's obvious that something is wrong. Ava is in the middle of insisting that Sarah should go get some rest when Sarah says they're here. To the surprise of nobody, Sarah has been under mind control this entire time. Ava is forced to fight off her friend, and then she runs to the common room where a lot of the noise is coming from. In there, she finds benefactors fighting against her friends, but no sign of Elmer or Sammy. With, but with so much going on, she barely has a moment to worry about them before she's forced to jump into the fighting. Elm eventually shows up and says that if he can get into the crystal room, he can take control over everybody's mind. The two of them are joined by a couple of others, and they smash all the lights as they go to hopefully slow the benefactors down. They make it to the gem room, but Elm warns that he can't hold them off forever. Blanca is of the opinion that they should simply kill them all, which is also my main thought, sends a much stronger message. However, this is a children's book printed from a Christian-centric publisher. If you think that there's going to be a slaughter, you're clearly reading the wrong book. Ava points out that a lot of the benefactors are young and likely don't even know why they're fighting, which I don't find to be a good excuse. Slaughtering people and hurting literal children simply because your boss told you to is not a good look. Ava briefly tells Blanca that Sarah has been compromised and to go get her. Then Ava goes back to the common room where the others who are still standing group around her and ask what their next move is. Then Dr. Iris shows up and commands all the benefactors to stand down, except as soon as the soldiers stop fighting, Dr. Iris shoots all of them with something she later explains is a heavy sedative. Ava is happy that the healer is there and I'm happy that actual adults have finally shown up. Everybody gets to work to heal the wounded. The doctor, who finally has her first name, introduces Trisha, along with the shaper named Hazel, but also all of the augmenters who are still standing. Blanca comes in with an unconscious Sarah. Trisha cuts something out from the base of Sarah's neck and has Blanca destroy it. She explains that it's a mind-controlling device implanted when they broke into the school in the first chapter. Trisha also explains that she put a tracking device on Ava, which doesn't surprise me at all. The way she hurt and then immediately healed Ava was a little too obvious. Hazel explains that she made both devices, although the mind-controlling one was done under a bit of duress. Ava then realizes who she is. Way back in the first book, Ava saw a traditional medicine clinic, but it was shut down. This is that doctor, but she's also Trisha's sister. Hazel explains that when her husband was in an accident, he died because they couldn't get to a healer in time. She studied traditional medicine so that she could help others without needing to rely on magic. Ava encourages Hazel to talk about why she was under duress to create the mind-controlling device. Hazel says that they were basically holding Trisha hostage, but the two of them were eventually able to break out from under that control. Sarah wakes up and she is suddenly able to tell them about how dangerous that she is. Now that the device isn't in her anymore, she can remember everything that she did. The entire thing ticks Ava off because the benefactors are doing the same thing that they claim to be protecting people from. But for now, they have to get out from the cave before the current benefactors wake up and come more come. Blake asks what they're going to do now, but the first step is simply getting away. As they load up the benefactors, Alm and Sammy reappear. Alm proposes hiding in the forest until Ava reminds him of the bugger flies.
Sammy then drops a bombshell. There are no fluctuations in the barrier. She was creating gaps by hitting it with her yellow magic. Alma is upset that she would have intentionally misled them about this, but Avery reminds them that the only thing that matters now is simply getting away. Then the real question, what to do with all the benefactors? Alma and Sammy have them under mind control on top of the sedatives, but as soon as the two mentalists leave, they're going to wake up and remember everything, which... Probably not the smartest idea to have discussed your plans to leave Magnus in front of them, but whatever. Sammy is on team murder. She has to remind them of how much death that the benefactors have already rained down on society. And furthermore, the benefactors wouldn't have hesitated to kill all of them. Ava decides that she's right, but asks how. Elm reminds Ava of how fragile that the cave is and how he's almost caused a couple of cave-ins, that dying under a crush of rubble would likely be quick, but as Ava goes to punch one of the walls, she finds that she still can't do it, even though she acknowledges that these people are horrible monsters who were sent to hurt literal children. Elm tells Ava that she's not weak for valuing human life, even if that life belongs to thoughtless military police. Ava simply doesn't want the guilt of even their deaths to hang over her. Eventually, they decide that if everybody else leaves first, then Elm and Sammy will get out as far as possibly can before releasing the benefactors. So they go with Ava waiting behind to leave with Elm and Sammy. Trish and Hazel stay behind because heaven forbid that we have actual adults around to help out. When the three of them regroup with the others outside, Elm tells Sammy to take the lead to the barrier. As they go, shapers destroy any bugger flies. There's a pillar of smoke and Ava almost stops as she cries about her destroyed sunflowers. Girl, get some freaking priorities. When they reach the barrier, the others are worried about if it's toxic over there as they've been led to believe. Elm assures them that he's been over there and that there's a colony waiting to help them on the other side. Ava only hopes that it's true. Sammy ushers the group through in three second bursts with Ava going last. Thanks for listening to my book snuck on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to help me out. The first is watching this video as well as all my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already caught up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snarks, always free and updated every morning. The only edit to Patreon is to become a member without paying. You'll get access to the same things on Tumblr, but on Patreon. Supporters can have access to so many more book snarks starting at $1 a month. Also new is a one-week free Patreon trail, so be sure to check that out. Special thanks to Don, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. Also, a huge shout out to Bunker Bash for making a sizable one-time donation. Thanks! If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snarks so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $6 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well. Just $10 per chapter. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of spicy short stories and two full-length novels. I also frequently run flash sales on my stories, and if you don't follow me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you can know when I might be offering things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys!